Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We have completed our series in the Gospel of Mark last week, and next week we're going to begin a new series in the book of Colossians, so I'll give you a heads up on that. Uh, This morning we're in a psalm. We're going to look at Psalm 127, brief psalm, but uh, one that I think is filled with... uh, doctrine and important uh, applications for us. Psalm 127, we'll begin with verse 1 through verse 5. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They are not, they will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Not long ago, there was an article in the opinion section of the Wall Street Journal on a suggested reading list uh, for the summer for high school students. It was a list of books and plays, and as I read it, I realized I hadn't read too many of them myself, but I had read a few, The Odyssey, Romeo and Juliet, and Ozymandias of Egypt. That last one, Ozymandias, is a good poem by a bad man, Percy Bysshe Shelley, but it is insightful. In it, Shelley wrote of a traveler he met from what he called an antique land, where he had seen two vast and trunkless legs of stone. The statue was in ruins. Its head and shoulders were in pieces on the ground. But on the pedestal were the words, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. The poem ends... Nothing beside remains of that colossal wreck. The lone and level sand stretch far away. So much for the great king's boast. The point is, men labor at building and they work to preserve it, but they can't keep it. The Wall Street Journal writer summed up the poem's meaning as, everything is dust in the wind. Well, there's a reason for that, for man's best efforts becoming wrecks. Solomon explains it in Psalm 127. It's not that time wears things down, it's that men build for wrong reasons. The psalm begins on that warning and explanation, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, The watchman keeps awake in vain. Some godly Scots got the message and made this verse the motto of the city of Edinburgh. Written in Latin on the city's coat of arms are the words, Without the Lord, frustration. Now, that's a sobering beginning to the psalm. But Solomon's purpose it is not to discourage, but to encourage. Because the opposite is equally true. With the Lord, success. When God is in it, nothing is vain. Our work is eternal. It will outlast the biggest works of the pharaohs or today's titans of industry. That's the, the real point. And it's true of everything we do. The business we build, the family we raise, the church we establish. When the Lord is the builder, then 
what we build will stand and last. Solomon knew that both from scripture and experience. He wrote here of uh, something he understood. He was a great builder. His greatest building was his first building, the temple, God's house. In the accounts of Solomon's reign in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, almost half of the chapters are given to the building of the temple. It's it's that important. It illustrates the psalm and, and what it means for the Lord to build and what is necessary in order for a church to stand and not become some colossal wreck as many churches have. One lesson we learn from the account of Solomon building the temple is when the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor carefully and diligently. Nothing in the psalm encourages carelessness or indifference. Just the opposite is true. Because the Lord builds, we build. We exert ourselves. And Solomon did that. He built efficiently and wisely. First, according to 2 Chronicles 2, he made all the arrangements. He uh, assigned a labor force. He contracted with Hiram, king of Tyre, for lumber and skilled workers. Then in chapter 3, he began building. He began building not according to his own design, but by following the pattern of the tabernacle. That's very significant. That was the blueprint, which was God's design, which is important if God's house is to be built by him. That's important if God is to be the builder. Both the tabernacle and the temple proper were simple constructions, a box with two chambers. The first chamber, the holy place, which contained the lampstand, the altar, of incense and the table of showbread was a rectangle. The inner chamber, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, was a cube showing symmetry and suggesting perfection. The design was plain, but the interior was rich. It was paneled with cedar and cypress, overlaid with gold and decorated with precious stones, suggesting God's presence there. And and indicating that where the Lord dwells, there's real richness and glory. In front of the temple, Solomon erected two freestanding bronze pillars named Yaquin and Boaz, which mean he establishes and in him is strength. The temple stood on Mount Moriah, the high point of Jerusalem, the city God had chosen to be the one place in the world where he would be worshipped in the only temple in the world built for him. All of that, I think, is significant. This one place of worship signified that there's only one God. And its place on the heights of the city showed that the Lord ruled over all. He ruled the earth. The two bronze pillars suggest that as well. They didn't support the temple. They're freestanding pillars, which seems to suggest that they're supporting the sky, suggesting that God upholds the universe. He is ruler over all things. A temple was highly symbolic. The temple was, I would say, theology in stone. Really, the temple with the arrangement of the altar was a statement of the gospel. Access to God is through sacrifice. That's Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. What Solomon built was, was beautiful and instructive because he built according to God's design, not his own imagination. I think that is one of the main lessons of this psalm and that we need to understand. He built by faith with trust shown in his obedience to God's pattern and he built with humility as well. 
Even before he built the temple, he asked, who am I that I should build a house for him? And then when he finished the task and the temple was completed and he de- gave his dedica- uh, dedicatory prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 18, he said, But will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. What a difference that was from the pagans. She didn't think God could actually dwelt within that temple, that it could contain God. He knew God fills the earth. He fills the universe. He goes beyond it. We talk in terms of theology of of the omnipresence of God. That's that he fills everything that is, but there's also the immensity of God, which is he goes beyond the universe. In fact, Isaiah speaks so eloquently of all of this in In Isaiah chapter 40, where he speaks of the nations are like a speck of dust on God's scale. And I think you can understand that as really the universe is that to God. Just a speck of dust to him. He can't be contained in this this world or in a house in this world. As Isaiah says in chapter 40, verse 22, he sits on the vault of the heaven or the circle of the earth. That's his throne. He's enthroned above it all and all of the... Inhabitants of this world are like grasshoppers. Now, that is a God that we can trust and whose word we can follow. A God who rules over all, who is sovereign over all and complete control of all things. And Solomon did. He trusted in him. He followed his instruction. He followed his pattern. The blueprint for that temple was God's blueprint and Solomon was faithful to it and the Lord approved of his labor. It was not in vain. When he finished, fire fell from heaven and glory filled the temple. The Lord built the house because Solomon followed his instruction. Now that's what gives success and peace. Trust in the Lord. Obedience to the Lord. That's what Solomon says in verse 2 of the psalm. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. What Solomon was doing there in uh, verse 2 is making a contrast between two attitudes toward God, between the attitude of independence and one of dependence. The world lives in independence. It it engages in frantic activity to raise buildings and businesses for self, for personal kingdom. Uh, It's humanism, really. That's what we see throughout the world, living for self, living for human glory. It's done for self. It's done for, for, for personal advantage. But the psalmist says, Solomon would say, that's all frustration. That's the story of Genesis 11, when the human race came to the plain of Shinar, made bricks from mud, and built a tower whose top, they said, would reach into heaven. They were going to build a house that would make a name for them. It was all self-confidence. It was all self-glory. What a contrast that is to Solomon's, who am I that I should build a house for him? God was excluded from the labor at Shinar, so he confused the languages, rather the language of the builders. He gave them many languages, and he scattered mankind over the earth and left the tower a useless pile of bricks. The idea that man can build anything that lasts from dust of all things is a folly that has been repeated across the globe and down through the centuries. That's Ozymandias. Look on my work, she mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains but a wreck and sand. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain 
who build it. But those who look to the Lord, who build according to His design and for His glory, who are diligent in the work and faithful to His word, they labor fruitfully and have sleep. Verse 2 is literally, He gives to His beloved sleep. It's a gift. It is rest. It speaks of peace and satisfaction. Peace and satisfaction that God gives to those who build rightly according to the Lord, who live according to His revelation. And this may be, this uh, reference to sleep, an echo of uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 and Solomon's dream. When he slept, God said, ask what you wish. And so Solomon asked for wisdom, and that request pleased God. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for glory. He asked for wisdom, that he would rule the people well. And it pleased the Lord so that he gave him that wisdom. But in addition, he gave him all the things that he might have asked for. He gave him riches. He gave him honor. Now that fits with the translation here. He gives to his beloved even in his sleep. It's a different idea, but both are true. Here, the the assurance is when we build well, when we build according to God's plan and for his glory, we can lie down at the end of the day and rest. We can sleep soundly knowing that our work is in His hands. It's not out of our hands and, uh, and, and out there randomly. It's in God's hands, and we can rest with that. He protects the house. He watches the city and keeps it safe. God is at work when we sleep. He blesses our labor when we are inactive, which means we can rest in Him. That's an encouraging end to the first half of uh, of this brief psalm, which teaches us how to build what lasts, how to build for eternity. Now, I find that interesting because Psalm 127 is classified as a psalm of ascents, which were traveler's psalms. They were psalms sung by pilgrims going up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. They would sing these hymns as they journeyed from all over the land. There are 15 psalms of ascents, and Psalm 127 is the central one. There are seven psalms before it, and there are seven psalms after it. So I find it interesting that a psalm about the settled life A psalm about building and sleeping, having a family, would be among the pilgrim psalms, the traveler's psalms, and in the middle of them. And yet, that's not really surprising at all. We we are pilgrims, not settling down in this world, but, but passing through on our way to our heavenly rest on our way to God's house. Just as those Israelites were traveling up through the land to the temple. But our lives as pilgrims in this world are not shiftless lives, but lives of labor and lives of accomplishment for the Lord. Psalm 127 is about that. It's about how to live and build what lasts. Not for self, it's for the Lord. It's not for time, it's for eternity. That's the pilgrim life. And it's a life that's lived in dependence on the Lord. But a house is more than a building, and a city is more than a place. It has citizens, and a house has a family. In the Old Testament, you know, a family is called a house. The house of Saul and the house of David. So the house, as a family is the subject of the second half of the psalm. The lesson, though, is the same. It is ultimately God's work and God's gift. Whatever lasts 
is built by Him and is built for Him. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They are not ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Unless the Lord builds the family, frustration. And again, Genesis 11 may be in the background here. In fact, I wonder if Solomon didn't have that chapter before him when he wrote this psalm. At the beginning of it is the Tower of Babel. When men built without the Lord, when they built for self, for human glory, it was vanity. At the end of Genesis 11 is Abraham. That's where we're introduced to him as Abram, exalted father. Verse 30 states his wife, Sarai, was barren. She had no child. And at the beginning of the next chapter of chapter 12, God makes his covenant with Abraham where he promises to make him a great nation. To make him a great nation with a wife who was barren. For years they had no children. All their efforts to build a family were as futile as the labors of Babel. But when Abraham was too old to have children, that's when God gave him and Sarah Isaac. It was a miracle. That's the point. It was a miracle of God. Listen, every child is a miracle. I think of having children as such a common thing, such a natural thing. And in one sense it is, but it's natural because God blesses. It is all a miracle of God. Every family that God gives is a gift. And I think we're to understand that literally on the face of it, but ultimately this is something more than that. The, the blessings that he speaks of here, the children that he speaks of here are spiritual children. Like a couple in the providence of God may not have a family, but each of them and each of us should strive to have spiritual children. That's the real fruit of the psalm. People, souls that are brought into the kingdom of God through the giving of the gospel or through the, the use of the gifts of teaching and, and, and exhortation and encouragement, building people up spiritually in the faith. But all of that ultimately is by God's grace. Material families, spiritual families. And Solomon wrote all of this to remind Israel of its dependence upon the Lord. Whether they built a house or established a city or raised a family, basic things, they are dependent on the Lord. The danger we face is thinking that we are able that we are sufficient in and of ourselves. And we can live independently of God. The slightest attitude of self-sufficiency or a neglect of the Lord in our thoughts is a sign of drifting spiritually. So Solomon wrote that arresting statement, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. That applies to everything in life. It applies to the church, to this church. Because the church is now the temple. The temple of stone is replaced by a spiritual house. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, we are the temple of the living God. And throughout the New Testament, the church is called God's house and his household, his temple. Not, not the building that we meet in, not this structure, as important as it is. It's not the church. You are the church. The people within it are the church. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the apostle says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. We are a house. 
but a house that's a temple and a house with priests. We are the house, we are the temple, we are the priests. In verse 4, Peter tells us how we are to be built, how this is to take place, how it does take place. We come to Christ, he says, as to a living stone. That's how he describes the Lord, a living stone. We're joined to him through faith. And in being joined to him by faith, we're joined to his life. He's the living stone. So what then do we learn from Solomon's psalm in the temple that instructs us on the church, on building it? Much, I think, first and most importantly, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. He is the builder. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 8 when he stated, I will build my church. This is my work. My church and I'm going to build it. It's a supernatural work. The Holy Spirit brings us to Christ as to a living stone, as Peter said, so that we become as living stones built up as a spiritual house. We, are, we, we see the Lord do that, build His house in, uh, all through the book of Acts. I know you're going through that in the adult Sunday school class with Mark and he continuing that study. As you look through the book of Acts from the very beginning, you see that Christ is the one building the church, building the house. You see that in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The disciples received the Holy Spirit, went down to the temple. They're, now they're equipped. This, this man who we studied so recently in the Gospel of Mark, who became fearful when a slave girl identified him as one of the disciples and went on to deny Christ three times, now is bold. He's got the Holy Spirit who's come upon him and the others who are in the upper room and they go down to the temple and they preached. And those with him and Peter as well spoke with tongues, with foreign languages, that those there could understand variety of languages and they're speaking miraculously in their various languages from all those represented from various parts of the world and they were giving glory to God. As a result of that ministry, miraculous ministry, 3,000 were saved that day. They continued meeting daily in the temple and also in homes, in houses where they were breaking bread, which is really a description of taking the Lord's Supper routinely. Chapter 2 of Acts ends with verse 47, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number. He builds the church. Later, the Gentiles are brought into the church and they begin rejoicing over that. Luke wrote about this in Acts chapter 13 and verse 48, that as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. That's God's work. He appoints. He adds. It's a supernatural work. But we participate in it. Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel of salvation on the first missionary journey. Paul and Silas and Timothy preached the gospel on the second and the third missionary journeys across Asia, across Europe. That's what we do. We join in God's work. We are His workmen, His fellow workmen. And there's a right way to do that. There is a white, right way to do the Lord's work. And so borrowing from our psalm, unless the Lord builds the church, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the flock, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Everything in this psalm and in the temple of Solomon instructs us about the church and about those in it and, and what we are to do. First, again, Solomon 
what he did was follow God's blueprint, the, the pattern that he gave Moses on the mountain of, uh, for the tabernacle. Secondly, he built the temple for God's glory, not for his own glory. We do both of those by obeying God's word. It's that simple. Peter's statement in which he calls us a, a spiritual house is, is germane, relevant to all of this. In verse 6 of that passage, Peter quotes Isaiah 28, verse 6, where Christ is called a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. So in verse 4, he's called the living stone. And then here in, in, the, in verse 6, he's called a precious cornerstone. The cornerstone gives direction and shape to the building. Christ does that. His word, his revelation does that for the church. But Isaiah 28 prophesied that the builders, Israel, would reject Christ. He became to them a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumbled, Peter said, because they were disobedient to the word. They rejected God's word. And so they rejected God's Messiah and the Savior. And so the work of the workmen came to nothing. Vanity. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. God only builds it when we follow His blueprint, which means when we are being obedient to His Word. That's how God builds His house. The temple was simple. It was a box, in effect. But it was filled with riches. It was filled with gold. And there's an analogy there with the church. A simple definition of a local church is a body of believers who meet on Sunday for the preaching of the word, the observance of the ordinances, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the practice of disciplines. Very simple organization, simple construction. Central to that, though, is the preaching of the word of God. The, the reformers understood that. One of the five slogans of the Reformation the first slogan is Scripture alone. It's the most important of those slogans because without it, the others can't be understood. It's the beginning. Scripture, the Bible, is our authority. If we neglect it for programs, I'm not against programs, church, we have programs, but when that becomes the dominant thing, when it's sort of like the tail wagging the dog, when we become indifferent to the Word of God, maybe a little bit bored with the Word of God, and other things take precedent over it, we will quickly fail. The house will fall and the work will be in vain. It, it is significant that some of the last advice that Paul gave to Timothy was in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the Word. That's the means of building the church. That's the means of building your life and your family spiritually. It is supernatural. Paul brings that out, the supernatural nature of the Word of God in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 when he states that as we see Christ's glory, and he's speaking of as we see it reflected in the Word of God, as we see it there, as we study the Bible, we are changed. Paul says we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That's what takes place in the life of the believer as he or she studies God's Word. We're transformed. Now what happened when, when Solomon finished the temple and dedicated it? Fire came down from heaven and the temple was filled with God's glory. That's what God's Word brings down to us. Just as the Shekinah glory filled Solomon's temple, so too the glory of Jesus Christ fills his church through the Word of God. In fact, where God dwells, there is riches. Church is a simple thing. It's not an elaborate construction. But within it, his real riches and glory. And that's the glory that the world needs to see. The life of Christ in the church. That's the Shekinah, the, the glory of God's approval. 
It is life that is nourished through God's word. And through God's word, his house is built. And through his word, his house has children in it. That's the second half of the psalm. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. And the children that fill God's house are believers. Often children in that house are from a Christian home where they hear the gospel, but Christian, that those that fill the house are believers in Jesus Christ. But so much of that, and I would emphasize this, comes within the home, a Christian home. Twenty years ago, or really more now, a man named David Calhoun, who's a church historian, um, wrote a two-volume history on Princeton Seminary. Its rise from 1812 to its fall in 1929 had a long and influential history. I think Mark was speaking in uh, his last lesson in the book of Acts and talked about how he used to hear when he was in seminary, and I used to hear this as well, I'm a few years ahead of Mark in seminary, how most seminaries have a natural life of about 50 years, and then things happen, they drift, and they change. <clears throat> well, Princeton Seminary had an influence <clears throat> for over 100 years, very significant, but it lost its evangelical life and influence when it departed from the Bible and doctrinal integrity. The effects of that were felt years later in baby boomers, which is my generation, who left the Presbyterian church. And Calhoun references a survey taken of these people who said that they knew very little about what their parents believed. Their parents didn't teach them. Well, the authors of the survey made two conclusions. That in, in passing on their faith to the next generation, parents have to teach their children doctrine, the doctrines of the faith. And secondly, to teach their children that there is only one way of salvation. In the psalm, verse 3 is literally, Behold, sons are a gift of the Lord. And in ancient times, sons were necessary for fighting to defend a city or defend a home. In verse 4, they are called arrows in the hand, meaning weapons. They are the ones in the end uh, of the psalm, in verse 5, who speak with their enemies in the gate. The gate was the courtroom in ancient cities where decisions were made and justice was established. And I think the picture there is they speak with the enemy and they defeat the enemy with their knowledge of the Word of God. And they, they triumph with justice. We need sons today in the church. Men and women. And I speak as one whose quiver is full of daughters, not sons. But the idea here is not simply males. The point is warriors, and that can be men or women who, are, who can defend the faith. And it is a thoroughly defensible faith. So parents must prepare them for that by teaching them God's Word, teaching them the doctrines of the faith. How else will they be able to defend the faith if they don't have that kind of instruction? But so does the church. It has that responsibility. That's its central task. It is, as Paul said, the pillar and support of the truth. Was he thinking of those uh, great bronze pillars of the temple? I don't know, but that's what the church is, as he says. And we need to dedicate ourselves to the building of God's house. Solomon did that. He said in 2 Chronicles 2, before beginning the work, who is able to build a house for him. That's humility, and that's dependence, and that's looking for the Lord for the ability to do that. And that's how we build. And that's the purpose for which we build. It's for him, not for us. 
Unfortunately, Solomon lost that vision, as you know, and his life in the end became a sad proverb. That happens to Christians. That happens to churches. They become colossal wrecks. May God give you and me the wisdom and faith to continue steadfast in His Word. There is no other way to labor and no greater labor than building for the Lord. We do it by being obedient to His Word. And that's just the beginning because what we do will go on for all eternity. Edmund Burke was one of England's greatest orators and statesmen, a, a brilliant writer who had a long career in Parliament. He devoted his life to public service. But when one of his associates in politics died suddenly, died at a relatively young age, Burke was shocked and sobered. He made the statement, what shadows we are and what shadows we chase. That's Ozymandias. That's the world. It builds and builds, but it builds to vanity and futility. May God keep us from chasing shadows so that we build what lasts, so that we build what is eternal. If you're here without Christ, you may be diligent in all that you do. You may be a student and a diligent student. You may be a businessman and a diligent businessman. You may be a faithful father and husband or mother and wife, a good citizen. All of that is fine and good and, and, and commendable in its place. But without Christ, for all of that effort, you're chasing shadows. Come to Christ. Come to the living stone. Be joined to Him through faith and become part of His house. He gives forgiveness to all who do and life everlasting. And as you live for Him, what you do is eternal. May God help us all to live in that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank you for this simple psalm, short psalm, but one that gives us the right direction. We're to look to you continually for all that we do. We're builders. We're in this life for a short time, and we're builders. We build businesses. We build families. We build all kinds of things. Our lives are to be lived constructively. But if the things that we construct are to be of any value, of, uh, uh, and of any lasting duration, they are to be built for you. Help us to understand that, to live for you, to live for eternity, not for time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has bought his people and brought them into your house and enables us to do that. We thank you for him and for your grace. In Christ's name, amen.